You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in half, cause I call the hologram brass, but I am the center inside the placenta of mass. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast, rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus, but I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. As always, I am your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, coming to you out of Lockhart, Texas. And one of my favorite guests is back with us on the show, fellow Texan, Father John Whiteford. This idea was first planted in my mind, let's say, when I heard one of his many homilies. I listen to them every week on my podcast app. The podcast is called From the Amvon. And you can find his homilies all over the place. I'm going to link to them as well on his homepage for his parish, St. Jonah Orthodox Church in Spring, Texas. But point being that I heard this one, this was back in October, November. I can't remember one of those. Shortly after the incident between Hamas and Israel happened on October 7th, this homily was called The Church in Israel. And it started off with the line, bad theology leads to bad actions. And it really stuck with me. That line stuck with me, not only because... There's a lot in that just to think about, and you can kind of see this being played out around the world and certainly through America, but specifically to this topic of Israel, the Middle East, Hamas, Palestine, and what's going on over there. He immediately after saying that line started discussing the bad theology being preached by men, pastors like John Hagee out of San Antonio. A lot of you guys know that was the pastor whose megachurch I went to as a teenager. So I'm quite familiar with the bad theology being preached by Pastor John Hagee, but it's not just him. This is unfortunately somewhat ubiquitous in America. We get into where a lot of this bad theology came from, dispensationalism, the thought that modern day Judaism is the same as the Old Testament Judaism, the thought that the state of Israel has some sort of equality, let's say, with the Israel of the Bible. All of these things are leading to horrific actions over in the Middle East Father John Whiteford is here to explain where these erroneous teachings spring from, what the true version is, the true teachings of the Orthodox Church, and all of this kind of thing. I think this is extremely relevant to what's going on right now, and I think you're going to learn a lot from this episode. After I recorded it, I listened to it probably four times back through because I learned a lot just each time I was re-listening to this. So I think you're going to like this episode Father John Whiteford is archpriest and pastor at St. Jonah Orthodox Church in Spring, Texas. And we're very lucky. I'm here in Lockhart, Texas. He's the dean of the Southern Deanery over Texas and Louisiana of the Diocese of Chicago and Mid-America, Rocor. Let's just bring him in right now. One of my favorite guests, Father John Whiteford. Welcome back to the show, sir. How are you? I'm good. Good to be back on your show. Yes, sir. Christ is risen. He is risen. I always make the guests give an intro for themselves. I'm not going to do that for you because you've been on the show many times. And if if y'all don't know who this man is, you can do some research on the internet. And uh, he's one of my favorite guests uh, to have on the show. Before we jump into the topic of the day, I want you to talk about the event that we're going to both be attending and be a part of here in Lockhart, Texas in September. Can you talk about that? Well, we have our second Ludwell conference, and um, they haven't uh, nailed down exactly the speakers, but they're going to be. A, it's going to be a good uh, slate of speakers, and it's going to be more than one day this time. And we are doing it in the barbecue capital of the world too, so uh, there's a lot going for it. And um, the the focus of it is on spreading orthodoxy in the South, and um, so I would encourage people who live in the South or have interest in Southern culture. I think even people who are not uh, in either one of those categories, they're just interested in how to spread orthodoxy will probably benefit from coming. Yes, yes, I agree. I, I know you said they haven't completely announced or lined up or finalized the speakers. Uh, do we know if you'll be doing a presentation? As things stand right now, they haven't... Uh, that, that, that I'm not on the list of speakers. Um, I'm I'm trying to get caught up on a whole bunch of stuff. But if they if I wind up being asked to speak, then that might happen. You know, but but I think they have enough people that they're wanting to invite that uh, 
it won't hurt if I'm not there. Now, I might wind up being on a panel or something like that when we have questions and answers, but we'll see. Okay. Okay. And uh, for those interested, I'll link to the webpage for the event in the show notes for this episode. And speaking of this episode, I wanted to have you on. You put out, or I guess Ancient Faith or one of the many platforms that that I hear you on, um, put out one of your homilies last sept excuse me last november of 2023 and it started with the line bad theology leads to bad actions and i've listened to that sermon multiple times and i can't like that stuck with me it was partially impactful because soon after you said that line you brought up uh, john hagee who most of my listeners at this point understand that that was the pastor i used to go uh, I attended his mega church when I was a teenager. And so a lot of the stuff we're talking about today, I had heard a very different version of the, ver- of, of, of the theology that Father John is going to discuss with us today. I had heard the, the Pastor John Hagee version and a lot of the things that's going on that are going on in the Middle East right now have to do with you know bad theology and bad action. So I, that's why I wanted to bring Father John on to talk about that. Um, first, I suppose, how how was, let's say, the theology that Pastor John Hagee is preaching uh, relevant to what's going on? And, and why do you say it, it's bad and then the actions that have, have come of it? Well, it's a distorted view of... Um eschatology, I suppose you could say, but, but but also just in terms of how they interpret the entire Bible, because it's dispensationalism, which no Christians believed in prior to about 1850. And that alone should be sufficient proof that it's false. Uh, there is a saying, all that's old might not be gold, but if it's new, it can't be true. <laughs> And when when you're talking about theology, the faith that was once revealed unto the saints, as St. Jude tells us, uh, if people didn't uh, figure it out until 1850, that means it's not the faith once revealed unto the saints. But essentially, uh, with this dispensationalist view of of, of scriptures, in terms of what it comes, how it works out in terms of Israel, is they see the the New Testament church and Old Testament Israel as being basically two paths to salvation that are running parallel instead of uh, the way St. Paul saw it, because he saw the Old Testament Israel as being symbolized by an olive tree and that those people who rejected Christ are like branches that are broken off from that tree and the Gentiles who embrace Christ are like wild, wild olive branches that are grafted onto that same olive tree. And um, the way that people like John Hagee will often talk about this is they'll say, well, that's replacement theology. That's anti-Semitic. Mm-hmm. And uh, well, the thing is, it's not replacement theology because it's still the same tree. Um, and, the, and the thing is, if you read what the fathers have to say about Romans 11, they point out that when St. Paul was making this analogy, he himself was a Jew who embraced Christ. So obviously, all the Jews were not abandoned. Uh, they, they all weren't broken off from the tree. There were thousands of uh, Christian Jews in the early church. And as a matter of fact, most local churches in the very early days of the church, the core people in those local churches were Jews. Now, that wasn't true of every parish. But that was true of a lot of them. And it's as time went on that the number of the Gentiles began to swell. And those Jewish Christians that were part of those communities, as you know, maybe another generation or two went on, they ceased to be distinguished from the other members of the Christian community. They, that they were not trying to separate themselves from the rest of the church. Uh, they no doubt intermarried and, uh, you know, several generations later, you don't have any people who identify themselves as being Jews distinctly. They just identify themselves as being Christians. Um, but uh, there's no replacement. There's just the continuation of this Old Testament tree in the New Testament with the Gentiles being grafted onto it. But 
you know, ever since the time St. Paul penned those words, there's been a steady flow of Jews who have embraced Christ. It's not been an overwhelming number of people, but you see them throughout church history. And uh, just in my own parish, I have uh, two people from uh, Jewish backgrounds that are members of my church, and they're very faithful and devout people. And um, I'm sure that's true of very many parishes. So uh, the idea that it's anti-Semitic is nonsense, but the key thing to keep in mind is, is their view is a completely novel view, and it was only made popular thanks to the Schofield uh, Bible uh, that uh, that was published, and Oxford kept it in print, uh, and, and it's, it's been in print continuously ever since the early 1900s. But that became a very popular study Bible, and uh, and consequently, uh, Protestant uh, denominations that never had any views like that practically started to embrace those kinds of views on the ground level just because that was what was sort of popular and people started buying into it. I was raised in the Church of the Nazarene, and historically Nazarenes were, um, I, I believe they were all millennialist. <laughs> uh, what is that, they, Father? They, that means they didn't believe there was a literal millennium to come. Uh, but basically, they believe that the uh, you know that, that the the church age was a millennium, and uh, but the dispensationalists are pre millennialist in, in that they believe that there's a thousand years yet to come, and so basically after Christ returns, there's a thousand years where Christ reigns on earth, and then for some reason, just for kicks. The devil's released from the bottomless pit, and we we basically have another re rebellion against God, and then that's put down, and then Christ hands over the kingdom to the Father. But uh, in the creed, there's a reason why we say, of his kingdom there shall be no end. We, we don't believe that Christ's kingdom is going to come to an end, <laughs> and, but they do. And uh, so anybody who's a who's a dispensationalist that says they believe in the Nicene Creed needs to reread the creed because they don't believe it. Mm -hmm. Is the dispensational part is is slightly confusing to me because I've heard evangelicals, um, I suppose more so than you know, Protestantism has so many sects within it, uh, but it seems broadly down here in our neck of the woods, evangelicalist seems to be the biggest. Um, is their version of dispensationalism basically what Hagee's preaching or is Hagee preaching something that's a little bit more extreme or how does that fit in together? Well, I would say Hagee takes it maybe a, lot, uh, a bit further than a lot of dispensationalists do. Uh, I, I've heard evangelicals criticize Hagee because essentially Hagee says that Jews don't need to become Christians. And for a lot of your typical Southern Baptist types that would be dispensationalists, they're not ready to go with them that far because, you know, the idea that there are people who don't need Jesus is something that is yeah. a bridge too far for them. But right. that's basically what Hagee believes. And then just to reiterate, dispensationalism as, I mean, even as a term, that was basically because of the Schofield Bible? Well, basically, they, the, the dispensationalism decided that the way to understand Scripture is to see it as a series of dispensations. So you've got the the dispensation at creation, then there's the dispensation that happens after the fall, then there's the Noahic dispensation after the flood, and then you've got sort of the Abrahamic uh, covenant, that dispensation, the Mosaic covenant is another dispensation. I think they even see the Davidic kingdom and, and that covenant that God made with David as another dispensation. But then they see when Christ comes, you've got the dispensation of the church. But they see the Old Testament Israel as still running concurrent with this, uh, this new dispensation. And so you've got a two-track plan of salvation, which you don't find anywhere in the Bible. There's, there's nowhere where St. Paul says, well, you know, if you're a Jew and you don't want to follow Christ, that's okay, because you can stay on the original olive tree. We've got a new one go. It, that's just not anywhere in the Bible, and you certainly don't find it in the Father's either. Hmm, okay. And, and then I guess I, I'm trying to put some of the things I've heard, because most of my listeners understand I am by, I'm far from an expert, but I do know 
um, some evangelicals in my personal life. And then I have followers that send me stuff, um, uh, email and et cetera. Just to quickly touch on Sola Scriptura, we don't have to get deep into it. Uh, you've written on it, you've spoken on it. Explain really quickly what that is. And I want to kind of tie it into where we're talking about di dispensationalism. Well, basically, Sola Scriptura is the idea that only Scripture is binding on the conscience. And uh, different Protestants will have slightly different ways of approaching the Bible. And uh, so you've got some that go so far as to say there's, you know, like the, the, the Church of Christ, the Campbellites, they say no, no book but the Bible, no creed but Christ. Yes. And, um, and so for them... The idea that you would look at any kind of uh, theological tradition outside of the scriptures, they would reject. But then you've got some Protestants, like, say, Anglicans, traditional Anglicans at least, and maybe Lutherans and some other more uh, classic Protestants would, would make a little bit of room for tradition. But the bottom line of it is that whenever it's not convenient for them to, to weigh tradition into the equation, they feel more than free to kick it out and, and dismiss it. Because they say, well, that's contrary to Scripture. Well, you're begging the question because you're saying my interpretation of the Scripture is more authoritative than 2,000 years of church tradition. Yes. Um, so it's not that Scripture disagrees with the fathers. It's that your interpretation of Scripture disagrees with the interpretation of Scriptures of um you know, thousands of years of uh, Christian saints and church fathers, and just the hubris of that ought to sink in with people and cause them to question, maybe that's not the best way to approach the Bible. Maybe that's kind of a prideful, yeah. egotistical way of pr approaching the Bible. Guys, something really, really sad and bad happened, and some people need our help in the Orthodox community. You probably saw this online or on the news. I saw a few news reports, actually, and it really was more impactful there. St. Theodosius Russian Orthodox Cathedral has suffered a devastating fire and needs our help. It was originally founded in 1896 with financial assistance from none other than St. Tsar Nicholas II's Russian Missionary Fund. St. Theodosius is the mother church for all Orthodox Christians in Ohio. The cathedral itself was built and consecrated in the early 1910s and for over a hundred years has been a beacon of light to Northeast Ohio. Its distinctive onion domes, which we love, have been a staple of the Cleveland skyline for generations. It's even been in movies, which I saw this on the news report too, most notably the 1978 epic picture, The Deer Hunter, starring Robert De Niro and Christopher Walken. Tragically, on Tuesday, May 28th, a fire broke out while a restoration crew was working on the cathedral. While no one was hurt, it nevertheless has left severe damage to the main dome and much of the inside of the church. As you guys know, I'm a firefighter, so I'm very well aware of just fires in a small part of a building, the smoke damage, the water damage that happens, a lot can happen even if the fire ends up being somewhat minor. The damages are estimated at over $1 million. In a wonderful touch of divine providence, the lampada hanging in the altar in front of the icon of Christ's resurrection never went out, despite all of the water that the fire department used. I can tell you guys, it's thousands of gallons of water. Isn't this amazing? All of the wind that was in there, the flying debris around as they put out the fire. Truly a beautiful bit of consolation from our Lord Jesus Christ to the faithful at St. Theodosius. Now our brothers and sisters at St. Theodosius need our help. If you are able to donate, please visit www.stTheodosius.org Fire Restoration. That's S T. T-H-E-O-D-O-S-I-U-S dot org slash fire restoration and help them out. And if you can't help monetarily, please pray for them and keep them in your prayers in this time of need. Thank you all and God bless. Yeah, it seems like those people might attack Pride Month that we're currently in. And it's like, <laughs> well, you yeah, there's all sorts of versions of pride and manifestations of it. Right. So, so then to clarify sola scriptura the the scripture alone is is what matters yet if they're a dispensationalist and they believe in sola scriptura there's a disconnect there because it's not in scripture well they believe that it is but the thing is what what a lot of i would say 
pretty much all Protestants, except for the ones that at least will give some lip service tradition, don't realize is they are interpreting scripture with a tradition. They just don't want to acknowledge that that's, that that's what it is. But, uh, you know, if you're if you're a Calvinist, for example, what John Calvin says about the Bible weighs pretty heavily on uh, on theological discussions because you're following a tradition that goes back to him. And they claim St. Augustine, but really St. Augustine only provides a little bit of support for some of Calvin's views, but not all of them. And um, so so there's definitely a tradition that they're using to interpret the scripture. And the same thing goes for Baptist. Um, you know, they have a tradition. And dispensationalism is one particular tradition that's become very popular. And uh, it's so popular that most evangelicals that have bought into this just assume that that's the way that it is. And so, for example, if you were to say the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture is nonsense, that would be to them pretty close to saying that you didn't believe that Jesus was Christ or, or that he was God incarnate. Or denying the doctrine of the Trinity or the virgin birth. I mean, they would just be shocked. Why? How can anyone believe the Bible and say there's no pre-tribulation rapture? Because they've heard it all their life. But that's not what anybody believed prior to the 1850s. That's a very novel view. Yeah, it, that's it's interesting. Can you, and this ties into what we're talking about as well and what I wanted to get to, because the bad actions uh, are happening in the Middle East right now. And I think sometimes there's some confusion or misrepresentations of what the modern state of Israel represents and mixed with what the Israel of the Bible is. There's a lot of confusion with that. Can we sort through some of that? Well, basically, dispensationalism sees Israel as the fulfillment of prophecy because they look at all these prophecies in the Old Testament about people, the Israel, you know, the, or the Jews returning to the land, and they interpret that as a future of prophecy. Well, most of the prophecies that they're looking at are actually prophecies about the end of the Babylonian captivity. So, so they're they're already fulfilled. <laughs> but uh, the other thing is, is they're not what they're not weighing into the equation adequately. Is if you look at the Book of Deuteronomy, when when uh, the prophet Moses talks about the blessings and the curses. What he says basically is that if, if you're not faithful, you're not staying in the land. God's going to remove you. <laughs> and only if you repent will God bring you back. Well, if as Christians you accept that the Jews wound up losing the land because they rejected Christ, did they repent of that? <laughs> not Not the ones that are still not Christians. Mm-hmm. And that's who came to settle the land of Israel. So how could that possibly be a fulfillment of prophecy? Because it's a fulfillment of prophecy that would fly in the face of the conditions that God said was uh, necessary for them to be uh, able to return to the land. And uh, so basically, you, and the other thing is you also have a secular state of Israel. And um, I happened to go to Israel 10 years ago, uh, as a matter of fact. And it just so happened to be Pride Month. Mm. And they had the rainbow flags all over the place. I didn't see them in the old city of Jerusalem, probably because they were had enough sense to realize that might not go over well with the local inhabitants or the tourists. But all over Tel Aviv, I saw pride flags everywhere. And they have gay pride parades. It, it, you, you, you often hear Israeli politicians bragging about how they're the most LGBTQ yes. uh, friendly country in the world right well you know that's that's sodom and gomorrah kind of stuff i mean god didn't just displace uh the the people of sodom and gomorrah he totally wiped them out <laughs> so so why would you think that you're seeing a fulfillment of prophecy when you've got a country that cares so little about obeying uh the old testament scriptures that they're bragging about that and um and they're openly hostile to Christians. The the Christian Palestinians have historically been treated horribly by the state of Israel. There's a really good documentary that if if you don't if you have not already seen it and you want to get an education, it's called The Stones Cry Out. And it's about a particular village that was in the Galilee area. And the, the Christians in that village were actually 
I believe some kind of like Maronites, Catholics or something like that. So they were not Orthodox Christians, but nevertheless, they're human beings. And they certainly were Christians and, and they were identified as such by the Israelis. Well, the, the, the people, these, these people were just simple farmers. And when the, when the, I believe it was the 48 war came, they were debating, should we flee or should we stay? And they decided to stay. Well, when the Israeli army showed up, the Israelis told them, okay, you've got three hours to get your stuff together and you're going over here to this, uh, uh, refugee camp. Well, they actually filed suit in Israeli courts and went all the way to the Israeli Supreme Court and they won. And so the Israeli Supreme Court ordered the Israeli government to give these people back their land. But the Israeli military decided to just bomb their village and, uh, and basically lay it flat so they had nothing to go back to. And so these people, the, the, the Israeli government just ignored their own Supreme Court. And uh, later on, you had Israeli settlers that wound up occupying the land that these people had owned. And so they're still living in this refugee camp. And then eventually uh, they're invited to go work in the fields that they used to own. And so they're picking olives from their own olive trees for people who stole their land. And um, how can, how any Christian could say that's okay? That that's a fulfillment of prophecy. These people are getting you know these Jews that have no. In many cases, in terms of you look at, just look at their DNA, if they have any is Israelite ancestry, it's pretty remote, and they reject Christ, and they certainly don't have any lawful claim to the lands that they just stole from people who have been living in there for generations. Uh, how, how many Christians could look at that and say, yeah, that's okay. When the, the Palestinian Christians that have been living there, they undoubtedly descend from those Jewish Christians that had lived on that same land at the time of Christ and the apostles. And they probably have more actual Israelite DNA <laughs> that, than the people who are coming along to claim their land on the grounds that somehow God gave it to them. But because of dispensationalism that, you know, this is the way uh, um, American evangelicals have looked at it, and unfortunately, in our media, we've almost never heard the other side. Right. When the when like when the Palestinian plight is talked about, it's only talked about at all in terms of well, they're a bunch of terrorists, suicide bombers. But you know, those farmers in that little village didn't start off as suicide bombers. But when you've got generations of people whose land was stolen from them, mm-hmm. who've seen family members shot for no good reason when they've had family members thrown in prison for no good reason. And this just keeps happening and happening and happening and nothing's ever done about it. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody that you might have some young men who grow up in that kind of a situation. It's like, you know what? Desperate times demand desperate measures. And if I have to strap dynamite to my back and blow up a pizza parlor to get back at these evil people who've been, victimizing my family for the last, you know, 70 or 80 years, then I'm going to do that. I'm not saying that that's okay. Certainly a Christian shouldn't do that, but it's certainly understandable on a human level. And I, I don't know that there are very many people, uh, you know, other than those saintly people uh, that, that have ever lived that would not start having some kind of violent reaction to that kind of treatment. And, um, but you know, the, Pat Boone is a, is sort of a typical Southern Baptist evangelical, uh, and uh, back in I believe it was in the '60s, there was a movie called Exodus, where the Israelis were portrayed as the good guys, and anybody that was opposed to them were portrayed as the bad guys. And uh, Pat Boone wrote the words to the song of that the, the theme song of that movie: "This is my land; God gave this land to me." Mm. And, uh, and and so we've gotten all this propaganda for decades, and we we you know if you put it to sort of a Star Trek Star Wars analogy, we see the Israelis as the plucky rebel alliance that are fighting against you know Darth Vader and the and the Empire, but that's not the reality. The reality is the exact opposite. They're they're the Empire. They're the ones that are that are that are stepping on the the the, the weak and the downtrodden. 
And we're supporting that. We, we, we were supporting evil. And, you know, atrocities, as I said in my sermon, you know, atrocities have been committed by both sides and both sides can point to those atrocities and say, this is why those people are evil. But as Christians, we can't say it's okay to kill innocent people under any circumstances. That's, it's never a good thing. We should be against killing innocent people. And, um, you know, what happened on October the 7th in terms of what Hamas did, anybody who was innocent that they killed, they should have done that. Anybody they raped or brutalized, they shouldn't have done that. Now, there's a lot of evidence that a lot of what was reported about what they did turned out not to be really true. It was It was basically hyped up by the Israeli government to push the narrative to justify what they were getting ready to do. But even if you take everything that they were accused of doing at face value and just accept it as a fact and evidence, that still doesn't justify Israel indiscriminately bombing some of the most densely populated uh, centers of, on the face of the planet and killing innocent people that obviously had nothing to do with it. They 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 don't get to decide what Hamas is going to do, and uh, right. and and if you're going to say, well, because what Hamas did, the Israelis are justified in slaughtering all these innocent people. Well, you can use the same logic in reverse and say, well, because of what the Israelis did to the Palestinians, Hamas was justified in killing all those people. Mm-hmm. Um, we shouldn't try to justify killing innocent, killing innocent people, but John Hagee will, yes. unfortunately. Right, right. Once a month, my supporters of this show and myself and a special guest have a Zoom meeting. It's not recorded. It's not posted. It's just private. It's between you guys, the guest, and myself. I do this because it means a lot for you guys who support me by showing me that this show means a lot to you. I love talking with you. I look at it as like a benefit for people that support the show, but it's really a benefit for me. I get to know you guys and have an off the record discussion with our guest. And, you know, sometimes topics you don't want to necessarily have all the ins and outs discussed online, if you know what I mean. So to be in this group, please go to patreon.com slash counterflow and donate $5 or more per month. And it gets you in this club. We do it once a month. It's a great time. It's great people. They're all smarter than me. So that's an upgrade from what you're used to. I can tell you that. The guests are always guests that people want to hear from. A lot of you guys will be familiar with many of the guests. Father Turbo's done it. Father Deacon Ananias has done it. David Patrick Carey has done it. My own priest, Father Ignatius, has done it. Father Moses McPherson has done it. It's a very good time. And I think you guys would enjoy it if you love this content please go to patreon.com slash counterflow, $5 or more per month. Thank you. To your, to play maybe li- quite literally devil's advocate against your empire analogy, one might, what if one would push back and say, Father, you said is Israel and, and the state of Israel is the, the empire here. And, but they're a very, very little small piece of land surrounded by Muslim uh, countries. What would you say to that? Well, the thing is, they've had the United States at their beck and call um, ever since they came into existence. And so when you when you have the United States backing them up, all those nations surrounding Israel have not been in much of a position to do a whole lot about it. Now, the thing is, that dynamic is changing. Mm-hmm. And we saw what happened when, when Israel uh, bombed that Iranian consulate, and then the Iranians launch a a, a, a missile and drone attack that Israel wasn't really able to repel contrary to, to all the uh, propaganda that our news media tried to spin. And uh, and that's why you didn't see the Israelis responding back with some sort of a devastating strike on Iran in, re- in, in, re- in response to that. I think they have to know that, that Iran now has the ability to level any place in Israel that they want to. Uh, Iran's not itching for a war, you know, contrary to the way that it's being portrayed in the in in the American media. Israel's the one that's been itching for a war because Netanyahu knows that if he doesn't have a war going, he's probably on his way out politically. Mm. So he mm. launched this war uh, in in Gaza. Some people would say that he allowed the attacks on October the seventh to happen because yes. he was looking for an excuse. Yes, and the thing is, is with that with the level of surveillance that they have over gaza it's 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 um it's not too hard to imagine how that might have happened right 
Uh, but even if we, you you don't accept that, they certainly have been going out of their way to get something going on in Lebanon, and they've been trying to get something going with 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 Iran. But their hope is that they're going to get the United States drug into it. Yes. And I don't think the United States wants to be drug into a war with Iran right now because they're too busy uh, with with a war they've already got going in Ukraine and, and a war they're itching to have with China for crazy reasons. Yes. Were you, do you see that article? I think it was the Times of Israel if it's, where it discussed uh, Netanyahu actually funding Hamas. Oh, yeah. Um, basically, uh, back when they were having all these talks about actually establishing two states, Israel funded Hamas, which was a, a nothing political entity in, uh, in Gaza, because they wanted gaza to be led by a different faction than the people in the west bank were being led by and then they could say yes. well look we can't have a two-state solution when the palestinians can't even agree with each other mm -hmm. so they've been trying to do everything that they could to prevent an actual two-state solution from taking place and unfortunately our politicians have been giving lip service to a two-state solution but i they have to know that that everything's being done to torpedo that and it's just it's just providing sort of uh you know a a fig leaf to cover up what they're really doing which is they're really just trying to ethnically cleanse uh the west bank and gaza and the thing is uh one thing that people should understand about the pal the palestinian population is the people who've been the most successfully ethnically cleansed out of Israel have been the Christian Palestinians. At the time of uh, the establishment of the state of Israel, 25% of the people in uh, what's now Israel, West Bank, and Gaza were Christians. Uh, Bethlehem was like 90% Christian city. Nablus was a was an almost like almost completely Christian city. There are now more Palestinian Christians that live in Sugar Land, Texas, than there are that live in Nablus. Wow. Uh, the, the Christian population in Bethlehem has gone down to like 8% the last time I saw statistics. And it wouldn't surprise me if that's not gone further down because the Christians are kind of caught betwixt and between uh, because the Israelis treat them um, uh badly and the muslims sometimes will throw them under the bus too and uh and and so and and the the uh, christian arabs tend to be very well educated people and so when they have an opportunity to go to the west to find a better life for their family they do it and um and i don't blame them if i was in their situation and i was trying to protect my family i'd probably do the same thing but it's a disaster for these ancient communities that have been there for all these you know thousands of years that are just disappearing and it's largely with the help of the united states and the israeli government certainly trying to facilitate that and i think their hope is to make the lives of palestinians so miserable that eventually they all just decide to go somewhere else mm -hmm. and, and maybe they'll still have an indian reservation of palestinians here or there mm -hmm. at the end of the day but that's that's all they're willing to put up with. You you had mentioned that uh, you were in Israel 10 years ago, and it, there's a, a stereotype out there that Israel, the state of Israel, is this kind of shining beacon of light for Christians to go visit in the Middle East, and that's the only safe place. Um, I want to ask you how you were treated there. And first, what, what did you have um, priestly vestments on, or as the hit piece called it, your cape? Um, were you, did you have stuff on that, that kind of showed that you were an Orthodox priest? Yeah, I was wearing a cassock and a cross everywhere I went. And, uh, I would say, you know, the average Israeli that I encountered was very kind and decent. I, there, I very rarely got a sense that, you know, people were, uh, unhappy that, that, uh, that me and my wife were there. Occasionally it did happen. We got on a bus in Tel Aviv at one point and i just got the sense that the people on that bus were not particularly happy to see us get on there uh, but especially when i was around orthodox jews 
that's when you'd start to see the real hostility. And um, I was, when we were getting ready to fly back to uh, uh, the United States, uh, I was at the Ben Gurion Airport, which is right outside of Tel Aviv. And uh, I walked past this Orthodox Jew that made a point of, and not spitting on me, but spitting as he passed me. But I, I didn't go into the Jewish quarter of the old city of Jerusalem when I was there. But I'm told that if you, as a Christian, go in there and you're identifiable as a Christian because you're wearing something that makes it clear that that's who you are, that the spitting will not just be as they pass, but it will be on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Father Deacon Ananias uh, has said such a, basically that, that happened to him when right. he was there. Uh, so you touched on it earlier. And this, I, I, I know for a fact, people get confused on this. The Jews in the state of Israel now, as opposed to, or let's compare and contrast with the, let's say, Palestinian Christians, where's the lineage to the Jews of the Bible? Well, undoubtedly, among the Jews that wound up in, dis in dispersion, there's authentic ancestry that goes back to you know, the, 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 the Israelite people. But many of, in many cases, though, we're talking about groups of people like the, um, I, I believe it's the Khazarians that were, were a tribe of people who converted to Judaism. And I'm sure they've intermarried with enough Jews over time that there's probably some Jewish DNA that's you know, circulating in that population. But it's not a lot. And um, and so but why should the fact that they adopted a religion that rejected Christ give them title deed to land that's actually been occupied for 2,000 years by, in, in many cases, Christians who actually do descend from Israelite populations that live there, and, but they accepted Christ. If you're a Christian and you believe that uh, that Christians are the are the seed of Abraham and inheritors of the promises of Abraham. Why would you then say, kick those uh, Christian Palestinians off their land and give it to these you know uh, Jews that may or may not actually have any lineage that traces back to the people who once lived there? And then a term I hear often is rabbinic Judaism. Can you talk about what that is and when that came about and how it? their view of of christ is well it's an important point to understand that judaism as it now exists is not the religion of the old testament right it's not it's not even the religion that you find in the gospels when you're talking about the jews that rejected christ it's a religion that came into existence after the destruction of the temple because prior to that, they actually had an Old Testament temple that they were offering sacrifices in. And so they were living the religious life that was dictated, at least in a, in a formal way, by the Old Testament. Maybe, you know, they, if those that rejected Christ were obviously missing the boat on that point. Right. But at least they had that connection with the Old Testament Israelite faith. But after the temple was destroyed, you have the rise of rabbinic Judaism. Uh, the Sadducees essentially ceased to exist as an independent group because they were so closely connected with the temple. And, uh, and so rabbinic Judaism is, is, is consciously a, an anti-Christian form or, or descendant of the old Testament faith. It's not the same. And so if let's say you see a Jewish temple in, in New York or Austin or wherever, is that rabbinic Judaism that they practice? Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. And then what is the Talmud and how does that fit into this discussion? Well, the Talmud is a, is a collection of books that record the sayings of different rabbis over time. And some of these rabbis that they're quoting from are even people that that were around either before Christ or around the time of Christ, like Gamaliel, for example, is quoted in the Talmud. Now, how accurate these quotes are, we have no way of verifying, but I'm sure that a lot of it 
probably really is, you know, accurate oral tradition. Um, and what's hilarious on one level is, is you have evangelicals that, as we've talked about, reject Christian tradition. But then you'll hear them quoting from the Talmud as, it's an, as if it's an authoritative text. When the Talmud is an anti-Christian collection of, of texts, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a collection of sayings that's all done by people who reject Christianity. And, and there's many anti-Christian things, blatantly anti-Christians, blasphemous statements that you'll find in the Talmud against Christianity. And yet they'll treat that as an authoritative source. And yet, if you quote to them St. John Christen, they'll say, oh, he, isn't he that anti-Semite church father? Well, okay, so, so you're, you, you prefer the company of the people who rejected Christ to the people who, who, who have spread the Christian faith. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> how, how, do rabbinic, how does rabbinic modern Judaism, what do they view the Talmud as? It, it, I assume it's not like how we view the Bible where you read from it in, in, in liturgy and whatnot. Well, there'd be some similarity as a way the way to the way that we use the church fathers. They see that okay. as uh, oral tradition that's been recorded in the Talmud. You have conflicting opinions, so they it's not like they consider it to be an inerrant collection of absolutely true things. But that is where they're drawing from when they're talking about how to understand the scriptures. Okay, is is those those kinds of writings. How does Revelation, the book of Revelation, the book of the Apocalypse, as we sometimes call it, fit into this discussion? And I, I want to ask you, I also had someone, I can't really remember if it was a private supporter Zoom or, or a, an episode, but they were saying it's possible that two, at least two thirds of the book of Revelation has already happened rather than it's stuff we're still waiting to as, a, as an entire book. Of, of predictions or whatnot, but how does the book of Revelation fit into this discussion with dispensationalism and with some of this bad theology equaling bad actions? Well, for dispensationalists, they like to take a book like the book of Revelation and interpret it in ways that fit into their view of how things are going to play out. Um, you don't hear them often quoting the synagogue of Satan uh, verse where Christ is talking about Jews who rejected Christ as being people who say they are Jews, but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Um, and I don't think that he was saying that they're not Jews in the DNA sense of the term. He's saying that they're not Jews in the authentic spiritual sense. And St. Paul talks about that too, as well, is that you can be a, 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 a true Jew if you're a Christian, and you can be a false Jew if you're not. So, you know, it, 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 often in Scripture, the word Jew is used in a negative sense because it's talking about people who reject Christ, but that's not always how it's used. And that's how Christ is using it there. Um, so, um, for them, it, you know, it, it, it plays a big part because, it, for one thing, the, the book of Revelation, because it's not obvious what things mean, it's easy to quote from it and say, this supports what I think, Yes, uh, when it doesn't necessarily actually do so. It's, it's, it's something that, from an Orthodox Christian perspective, we never read it liturgically, right? and that's because it's so easy to misunderstand it. But you can understand it if you read what the Fathers of the Church have to say about it. Uh, particularly, St. Andrew of Caesarea is considered to be the definitive patristic oh. commentary on the book. And there's two translations of it that are available. One of them is by Presbyteria Eugenia Constantinu, and that's the that's where she, yes. how she got her PhD, was was producing that text. And it's got very good footnote, footnotes, and it's published by the Catholic University of America Press. Yes, we're actually, I'm having her on at some point to discuss uh, that actual book and and yeah, that's that's right. I knew that Saint Saint Andrew of Caesarea sounded familiar. That's why I've been reading right. through that. Right. Okay. So I know I was going to ask you, and you kind of touched upon it that we don't read from it liturgically uh, in the Orthodox Church, and it's been a long time. I was I went through an atheist period for twenty years, so I haven't been to another church that's not Orthodox, uh, to be a, quite honest, since right. I was a teenager. But do mega churches or, or some denominations, do they teach and read from it from the pulpit? 
if it's if if they have a heavy emph- em- emphasis on dispensationalism, they'll preach from it on a somewhat regular basis. Okay. And when I was a a, a kid growing up in the Nazarene Church. My recollections, especially from the 70s and the 80s, but the 70s more so, I think I heard a sermon on the end times at least once every other week. And we normally had at wow. least three sermons a week. Sometimes we had a lot more than that if there was a revival going on. But we had Wednesday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night. And about every other week, at least one of those sermons was going to be on the end times and, and would be designed to scare the pants off of you, which they were very successful in doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> because right. it was always, I, I grew up literally thinking that I would probably not live to graduate from college and, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, or see the age of 30. You know, I just didn't think that was likely to happen. And, uh, and, and I remember when I was in college, the discussion came up in, in in a class at least once where people were were talk, they were talking about was it worth your time to finish college <laughs> because the world might end. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and, uh, and and uh, you know the argument was well hey you you should sink the time into preparing even if the world is going to end because you're going to be more effective. But that's how quickly we thought the world was likely to come to an end back then. And uh, I would imagine with as many things that have been going on in the world of late mm-hmm. that there's probably at least some churches that are beating that drum pretty hard right now. Mm-hmm. Was it you once before you were on, you mentioned some sort of show or movie that was out around the 70s or 80s. And I cannot remember what it was called, but uh, the late great planet Earth. Was that sort of wrapped up in this trend of talking about this? Oh, that was played a huge role. Hal Lindsey wrote the book, The Late Great Planet Earth, and they actually yes. produced sort of a documentary type movie that I remember going to see in the theaters. Uh, and I think that was like maybe in the early 80s, something like that. But there was another series of movies uh, in the Left Behind series. Yes. And the very first one was done when I was still a kid living in California. So at least prior to 1977. And, uh, and I, you know, Nazarenes used to not believe in going to the theater, but they would show movies sometimes at church if it was on a Christian theme. And I remember we went to some other church than our own church on a Sunday night because they were showing this movie. And, uh, and it was all about, you know, the, it, be, it begins with this husband and wife and the husband is shaving and the wife. Uh, is listening to the radio and they're talking about people disappearing all over the earth. And then she's talking to her husband and the razor is continuing to go. But then eventually she looks in there and her husband's gone because he's not answering her. He looks in there. She looks in there. He's gone because he's been raptured up, but she hasn't been because Uh she wasn't saved. And, uh, and then she goes to her pastor who also wasn't raptured up because he was a liberal modernist. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, and when she, when she comes in, he's like pouring over the Bible, trying to figure out where did I miss it? Where did I miss it? Because he realizes that he did. And uh, and they did a whole series of movies. I didn't watch them all, but I remember watching uh, one of the subsequent movies many years later after I was Orthodox. And uh, this pastor popped up again. He's like out in the middle of the woods in some hut, and he's talking to the same woman. And and they're trying. You know, she's asking questions about what's coming up next. You know, and he 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 reaches up and he pulls down a dispensational truth chart. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> Which you can know, if you go if you go to a Protestant Christian bookstore and ask for you know, show me the book dispensational truth. This is the <laughs> the book where you have all these end time charts that show oh, you wow. how the end times are going to play out. So he's out in the middle of the woods running from the Antichrist, but he's got a dispensational truth chart they can pull down. In this hut out in the woods, and he's saying, "Here we just had the uh, the seventh uh, bull of wrath, and <laughs> anyway, it, it, the most ridiculous thing is you ever saw." But this was big, big among uh, uh, evangelicals, and the books, you know, the Left Behind series books were very popular. Wow! I and we still got about ten minutes here, or fifteen minutes. I want to ask about because I know the term Zionist fits into this discussion and it's thrown around as a pejorative sometimes. And, uh, you know, I, I've talked on here about useless words. I don't, 
I hope this word doesn't become useless, like the term racism or anti-Semite, just people right. just saying it and making up new definitions for it. Vaccine. Whoops. I have to edit that word. Um, how does that fit in? What is a Zionist? And then I want to also pair this with um, Father Turbo Qualls has said, when you come to orthodoxy, there's a few things you have to stop on the geopolitical level. And one of them is you can't be a Zionist. And I want to get your take on why you think that, or if you think that, if you agree with them, I assume you do, why that would be, and what is Zionism? Well, Zionism is this whole idea that the Jews need to reestablish a homeland in Israel. And um, and a lot of the uh, Jewish Zionists were not even a religious. Some of them were atheists, but they believed that they needed to do this just basically for their own self-interest. But you have Christian Zionists that are more Zionistic than most of the Jews are, like John Hagee, that take it to another level. Uh, and so an Orthodox Christian can't be a Zionist in that case. And despite what a lot of the people in the media want to say, not being a Zionist or being against Zionism doesn't make you anti-Semitic. Uh, some of the most articulate people against Zionism are Jews. And uh, they're not; th these are not Christians, and so I'm not advising that you listen to them on other subjects. But when they're talking about what's going on in Palestine right now, the kind of atrocities that are being committed, these are some of the best sources of information that you're going to get because they're they're willing to tell the truth, and uh, and they're investigative reporters in many cases, like Max Blumenthal, yes, Aaron Mate, Glenn yes. Greenwald. These are yep. all Jews. But there are Jews that are willing to tell the truth and be honest, and they're not Zionists. They're anti-Zionistic. And uh, what's, the, what's the name of the guy? Finkelstein. I can't remember his first name, but he's been studying this issue for many years, and he's debated a lot of more prominent pro-Israeli people, and I've not seen any of them come out on the better end of those debates because mm -hmm. this guy's parents were in concentration camps, if I remember correctly, so he's not exactly you know, in favor of Jews being taken out and shot. Right. But he's also not in favor of Jews doing that to other people. Basically, what he says is, is I would be betraying the uh, the memory of my parents if I didn't speak out when the same thing was happening to other people. And right now, it's the Israelis that are treating Palestinians that way. Mm. Uh, in closing, I'll, I kind of want to let you take this where you'd like to sort of wrap on why bad theology equals bad actions, how it's playing out, how it's manifesting itself right now in the Middle East. Um, and that's specific to that topic. We could talk about bad theology having bad actions uh, by walking down downtown and seeing rainbow flags on churches, but I specific to Israel, Palestine, dispensationalism, and then maybe focus on, we often talk about the royal path of uh, a different way in the Orthodox Church, how we should see what's playing out in, in our theology? Well, I mean, the way that it's, it, the like the John Hagees of the United States are the only reason why Israel is able to get away with what it's doing right now, because Israel could not get away with it if the United States was not backing them up and continuing to supply them with the weapons and also with the with the threat of joining in with them if anybody on the outside were to attack them. And um, the Israelis have, have uh, essentially captured most of our politicians. It, it, you know, we have APAC, yes, which gives a huge amount of money to politicians on both sides of the pol political spectrum. And there are very few politicians that have the guts to uh, go against their agenda father let me when interrupt you real quick on this did you see um, thomas mass did you see thomas massey's interview with T tucker carlson i saw parts of it i didn't see the whole thing but he is one of the few the yep. very few politicians that's willing to buck that old trend like my my congressman uh, uh dan crenshaw for example he was criticizing tucker carlson as being on the payroll of putin which is obviously not even true and then People were pointing out, okay, how many millions of dollars have you received from APAC, Dan? You know, he, he's getting a huge amount of money from this pro-Israel lobby, and uh, and you had you, you, some Israeli official a couple of years ago was bragging about the fact that I could get 
uh, I could get 70 U.S. senators to sign a paper napkin if I asked them to. Well, you know, we, we, we don't have our politicians representing the actual views of the American people. Plus, we're, we're getting gaslit by our mainstream media on what's actually going on in Israel. And basically, there, there's not a Fox MSNBC divide on this issue by very right. much. Uh, you basically, all the mainstream media is telling you Palestinians bad is real good. And I'm, I'm sad to see a lot of conservative uh, Americans buying into this whole narrative that Anybody who's against what Israel's doing is just a pro Hamas terrorist, and uh, and they're somehow you know radical left wingers. Right. I, I'm I'm just against innocent people being killed. And when you're dropping bombs on a refugee tent city, uh, and you, you, you there's no way to justify that. And the American people, uh, if they knew the facts, would not go along with this. Uh, you, you've you've met my. Uh, my son-in-law Ben, I, I, I believe, and he and my daughter were at some sort of a young Republican shindig, and uh, they had a resolution expressing unequivocal support for the state of Israel. Oh my! And my son-in-law, you know, suggested an amendment. He said, "I'd like to strike the word unequivocal, because unequivocal means we're going to support them no matter what they do." And they wound up having a long. Uh, back and forth on this subject. At one point, he said, you know, I think I'm probably the only person here that's actually fought jihadist terrorists that were using actual human shields. <laughs> uh, but uh, but when we came up against a situation where some jihadists were at, shooting at us from inside of a school with a bunch of children, you know what we didn't do? We didn't blow up the school. Right. And uh, and. Uh, and, and that's not to say that Americans, the American military hasn't killed a lot of innocent civilians, but at least we make a, a pretense of trying to avoid killing this innocent civilians. And, and there's at least some lines that we've not been willing to cross. But Israel has basically just thrown it all to the wind and, and basically dared anybody to do anything about it. And th so they've actively been starving the Palestinian population. You see these skeleton skeleton-like children that you see dying in hospitals because they're malnourished. And that's 100% within the control of Israel. And the United States built that pier that was supposedly going to bring food to the Palestinians. Why? Because the Israelis were blocking the shipments. But then we find out that they were actually using that pier to send more weapons into Gaza uh, rather, rather than really doing what they said they were going to do. Um, there's just no way that that can possibly be justified, but that's that's only possible because we have people who have uh, erroneous theology that will back Israel no matter what. If we actually had Christians in this country that would not back Israel no matter what, but I, and I'm I am not in favor of wiping out the Israeli population and just displacing them. You know, I think you have to deal with the reality of what we have now, but I do think. The Palestinians should be somehow compensated for the stuff that's been taken from them, and they certainly should be allowed some parts, uh, the West Bank and Gaza, for them to live in. And and and, uh, and inside Israel, they should be given the same kind of rights as everybody else has. And uh, and it, when it, when it's being compared to an apartheid state, this is often dismissed, but it certainly is an apartheid state when you're talking about how Palestinians live in the West Bank and in Gaza and in in, in the West Bank. You can't go from one village to the next without passing through several Israeli checkpoints. And it was very recently we had a, a, the nun who is the uh, head of our school in Bethany, the Russian Church Abroad School in Bethany, which was mostly and mostly had Christian children when it was established. It's now mostly Muslim children that are in school. They still have some Christians children, but they're now the minority. But anyway, this nun who is a tiny woman from Germany, uh, was talk, talk, talking to clergy in Chicago about how she got stopped at a checkpoint not too long before she gave this talk. And before she knew it, she had like seven Israeli soldiers with guns pointed at her, threatening to shoot her because she apparently said something that they didn't like. And she said, I just want you to know that I'm a German citizen. And if you, if you kill me, you're going to have to answer for it. 
and 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 she was told we'll say that you attacked us and she said a nun <laughs> and, and then the next thing she knew the those soldiers left and then somebody else came along who started being conciliatory towards her and then she was allowed to pass on but the thing about that story that you might not immediately think about is she was a german citizen and can make that statement you're gonna have to answer for it mm-hmm. palestinians don't have citizenship somewhere else they don't have a foreign government that's looking out for them and so if the israelis had just shot a palestinian under the exact same circumstances no one would have cared mm-hmm. and they literally we have video of them literally shooting kids in the street that are doing nothing to harm anybody else and yet this continues to happen day after day and this is in the west bank you know the the october 7th attacks happened for, were launched from gaza how that justifies killing Palestinians in the West Bank is beyond me. Mm-hmm. And also in closing, how the irony of maybe the Orthodox Church being the, the body of Christ and, and Israel, as we say, rather than the state of Israel, how have we been able to not let this bad theology infiltrate? Well, we've never bought into the whole Zionist uh, ideology. On the other hand, I think it is one important point that we should make here is that we don't want to go to the opposite extreme where we right. start buying into this idea that Jews are evil. And because for one thing, we really do believe St. Paul talks about Jews eventually becoming uh, Christians at the at the end. You know, he, he, he prophesied that that day would come and uh so we don't want to be a, a, the the kind of people that make it harder for that to come about. Right. We don't want to have it happen in spite of us. We we want to always welcome anyone who's interested in the Orthodox Church, and we and we don't want to see anybody as inherently evil. People are evil or not evil based on what they do. Yes. So people who do evil, we should we should say what you're doing is evil, but. Uh, you know, he who who does righteous is righteous. The scripture tells us, and so uh, anybody who's who's open to the truth and is willing to embrace it, we should embrace them, and and uh, not we should not be influenced by ideologies. Yes. Period. Right. Ideologies decide to make it, it with an ideology. You've got a hammer, and you start seeing everything as a nail. So you yes. make everything fit your ideology. And there are ideologies like fascism, for example, where you you view everything through a racial lens, and you 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 basically see one race as being superior to other races, and the the Jews as being particularly evil. There's no basis in the Christian tradition for that kind of talk. It's only the theology of non-Christian Jews that's the problem. It's not their DNA. It's not who they are. And any any Jew who embraces Christ is not only as much of a Christian as anybody else, but in a certain sense, they're coming back home. They're, St. Paul says that they're, uh, if the wild branches can be grafted onto the olive tree, how much more so the natural branches? How much more so can they be attached and thrive on that olive tree? So we, we should want to encourage the, anybody, including Jews, to embrace Christ. And be open to that and not set up barriers or we're running people away because we communicate to them by the way we talk that we don't like them we or that we hate them. Right. Well said. I'm glad you covered that here at the end. Father John, would is there anything you want to plug, your your blog or really anything you'd like? The church website, any of it? <laughs> well, the church website is Saint spelled out, Jonah.org. And my blog is is father spelled out john dot blogspot dot com. But if you just Google uh, my my name, you'll find those things. Um, you know, I've, I've got lots of projects that I've got on the back burner, and I'm trying to I'm going to try to spend the next couple of months clearing the deck so that I can start working on some of those things more. So, mm-hmm. uh, so so we'll see. Hopefully, I'll be able to get to that. My grandkids are occupying a good bit of my time right now, <laughs> and I I know that's your favorite thing. So I that's that's yeah. probably good that they're occupying that time. Yeah, I'm not I'm not complaining. <laughs> right, <laughs> Father John Wyford, thank you so much once again for being here on Counterflow. Thank you. I told you you were going to learn a lot from Father John. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. As for this show, let's see. Well, CounterflowPodcast.com. Support us at patreon.com slash counterflow. Follow me on Twitter at BuckRebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. And let's see, I think that's about it. Until next week, 
I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Have a great week. We'll see you. You get split in half till I call him the hologram wrath. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.